Brothers and sisters, why are you here? I ask that question a lot of time among my friends. I get a lot of different answers. I heard an answer one time that I used. It's not the answer I need, but I still use it. Old acquaintance of mine told me he had to give a speech at an institution where the people there were mentally impaired. And he got up and he said, I didn't really know how to start, so I said, why are you here? And he got silence and finally a hand raised from the back and the man meekly said, I'm not sure why you're here, but the reason why I'm here is I'm not all there. <laughs> now, I've used that a lot of times. When someone asks me, why am I here? I say, because I'm not all there. Just part of me is there. I'm still dragging the flesh. But is that not a suitable question to ask? Why are we here? I think that question deserves an answer. What was God's purpose in creating you? Or for that matter, creating anything. Not just you, anything that he did create. Now again, there's a second question. How can I become involved in whatever that answer is? Not only why am I here, but what am I going to do about it? Now my answer to it, of course, is the reason that I'm here, the reason that you're here, the reason of anything being anywhere that God created was for the purpose of glorifying God. Now, how am I going to do that? How am I going to get involved in that? Well, one, of course, answer to the first question of why we're here, you could say to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, but I would like to modify that just a little bit by saying we are here to glorify God and we can participate in that by enjoying Him forever. When you enjoy God, you will bring him great pleasure. Now, my subject tonight is the Father of Glory. And I want you to stand with me so that you can stretch if you want to as we read from Ephesians 1, 17. that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Please be seated. The portion of that prayer by Paul that I'm addressing tonight is the Father of Glory. Now I know this is in other translations called the Glorious Father, but there's a reason that it's called the Father of Glory to my mind because he is the Father of Glory. That means he's the source of glory. That means he's the genesis of glory. That even means he's the genius of glory. Amen. That means if there is glory, he produced it. Amen. That means if you got glory, you got it from him. Amen. That's the father of glory. Now we're going to find out tonight that God's got a great concern for his glory. And for good reasons that we will find out. Now that means... 
Where glory is found, God gets the credit. It's just that simple. If you got any glory, God gets the credit. And I pray that you do have some glory. Therefore, when you read that God will not share his glory, what that means is God will not allow another progenitor of glory. No one else produces it. It is him. But he will share his glory with you. His glory. He will not allow you to produce your own. Now, what is this glory of which the God is the Father of? Well, that's been addressed all week. Certainly, his glory denotes what is inherent in his being. That goes, I think, without saying. It is the excellency of his person. Certainly, it consists of his greatness, but also his beauty. Yes, it's his goodness. Here's a word that hadn't been used this week. Our God's got gravitas. He's a weighty God. They wondered whether our president had it or not, but our God does. In Scripture, as has been shown, His glory is often His emanation. It's the revelation. It's the coming out of what's in. It's the exhibition and communication of what is inherent in him. Well, inherent in him is creative power. So he creates the universe, and they declare his glory, see. But they didn't declare very much of it. There's a lot more to come. I'm not going into it all, but he talked about the law that come from his mind. Well, it had to be glorious, and it was given with glory. There it is. It revealed more of it. I don't think he consulted with Congress about what the law was going to be. It come from his mind. I guess if he's got two laws, he must have two minds. I don't think so. Yeah, it was glory, glorious. But he didn't reveal it all there. But he always is in the process of revealing more and more and more of his glory. Which is what heaven's going to be. That we'll talk about a little bit later on. But ultimately, for my purposes tonight, his glory is summed up in his son. He has committed the administration of his glory over to the son. And he gave him the title, Lord of Glory. We had a whole sermon on that just today, Brother Phil. I appreciated that. So God commanded the light to shine out of darkness and is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or person of Jesus Christ. There it is. He turned it over to him to administer Negatively speaking, he said, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them, who, Jesus, is the brightness of his glory, the Father's glory. Now, Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came a voice, of course, from the Father of glory, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased Jesus receiving that glory to administer it to the rest of God's creation. Now, God is communicating this glory. Now, I noted, and I was looking here, he communicated a lot of it in grace. He did that, of course, through Jesus Christ. Grace is a component of glory. Note a couple of scriptures that use grace and glory and how they just dovetail. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, which is equivalent, according to the riches of his grace. Again, 
the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians 2, 7. Philippians puts it this way. But my God shall supply all of your need according to the riches of his glory by Christ Jesus. So it's just nearly interchangeable words. So uh, I draw the conclusion that naturally grace is a big component of this. I'll have more to say about that later on. Now the Father of glory has revealed himself for a reason. Certainly, among those reasons is for our salvation. Yes. And for our happiness. Yes. Which is exactly what Jesus come, for our salvation and our happiness. So, because he turned the administration over to Jesus. So Jesus in his suffering comforted himself with this, the prospect of obtaining even more glory. So he uses these words. The hour has come when the Son of Man should be glorified. And how was he going to be glorified? He says it this way. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now what is fruit but the glory of the seed? That is us. He's going to bring forth much fruit. Amen. Now when Jesus, you see, seeks the Father's glory, and he seeks his glory, he seeks it as the goal of that great work for which he came into this world that he's about to accomplish there on the cross. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto you. God put it this way in Isaiah. And I, I call this heavenly dialogue, God talking to the Son. He said, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of this earth. Amen. Everyone who's called by my name, whom I created for my glory, Amen. whom I formed and made. That's the reason we're here, created for his glory. Now Jesus says, Father, I want you to glorify thy name. God says, I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. Now those words were so comforting to Jesus in that moment of agony that he could approach the cross with joy. You cannot separate joy from the glory of God. If you find God's glory, you're going to rejoice. And if you're not rejoicing, you have not had his glory revealed unto you. Now here's a resting consideration. God's glory is the praise that he received from you. Psalms 50, 23. Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me. Negatively put, prophet Isaiah, my glory, God says, I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. There it is. Jeremiah 13, 11, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. So I get to thinking of these nouns people, a name, a glory, all interrelated. I just find it fascinating when you read like in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. That praise and glory and grace are so interrelated, I don't see how you can hardly talk about one without talking about all of them. Philippians 1.11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There it is again. Righteousness, Jesus Christ, glory, and praise of God are all so interrelated. 
then how do you separate them? That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving, that's praise, of many redound to the glory of God. Certainly we can see here that when you praise God, you're literally adding to His glory. Like, like it's not a static thing, you know. Amen. So the praise of God obviously implies a high esteem of God. You've got exalted thoughts of Him when you praise Him. You've got great delight in Him. Surely you're satisfied with Him. You're joyful of Him. You are rejoicing in Him. And then I see that praise is rejoicing in him. Psalms 33 and 2. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Amen. Now, you note that God's name and his glory usually signify the same thing. So when Moses says, show me thy glory, God says, I'll proclaim my name. Well, he's not ignoring his request. Amen. Psalms 8, 1, How excellent is thy name in all the earth, and who has set thy glory above the heavens. Psalms 148, His name alone is excellent, and his glory above the heaven and earth. Now, I'll tell you what, I've just profited a many a time when I see the word name just put glory there. That won't always work. Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, take out of them the people for his glory. Say, either one. It works so many times. Now, I'm not suggesting that I won't change any translations, but it just fans it for me. Whatever the intentions of God in the creative work, including you, including me, is included in the glory of the Father. That includes His revelation of Himself to you and your love and joy in that revelation of Himself, especially as it was expressed in Jesus. Now, God talked about that a lot, his revelation. He'd use, of course, the prophets to demonstrate this, and he'd say words like, Hear, so that's a revelation. Here is my servant whom I uphold. Here's my chosen one in whom I delight. Now, if God delights in his servant, I think you will too. I'll put my spirit in him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. Now, I think we're going to find out here in a few minutes, justice is the flip side of the grace. It is part of the glory. All right. So his revelation of his glory to us in Jesus will produce joy. It will produce delight. If you get the revelation of his glory, you will rejoice. If you are not rejoicing, you have not received the revelation of his glory. Ultimately, they become one. They are so closely associated. Now, of course, God's revealed himself to us as part of his glory in the knowledge of that glory. So I think of the wor words of the New Covenant, they shall all know me. Well, what is knowing him unless it's seeing his glory? See? And now you're getting close. Certainly that revelation is granting his righteousness to us in the gospel, in the glorious gospel. And what's your reaction to his righteousness granted to you in the why you are joyful, you are thrilled, you believe it, you love it, you find great satisfaction in it, you find happiness in it. God found happiness in it. I think you will too. 
Now, as the brother said, to try to define glory and try to pin it in is futile. I figure it's going to take God an eternity to reveal it all, so I'm not going to reveal it all. But I've got to get something on grasp tonight that'll help me. So here's where I always come back to, John 1, 14. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now what I see, he was full of grace and truth. Now, now this is something I, I began to get a grip on. He was full of grace and truth, aspects of glory. Now, I just listed two, just list two things there, but uh, I, I, I'd just like to run with them a little bit. So, if I look at truth, I th well, that's righteousness. That, that's doing what's right. This is the truth. That's righteousness of God. That's His justice. When you look at grace, you think of mercy, you think of peace and loving kindness. But then when I think of righteousness, mercy, and peace, I think of why well, that is the two elements of the foundation of the throne of God itself. That's what God's sitting on. That's what's upholding God. That is his throne. Now I know all that because... Proverbs says, mercy and truth preserve the king. <laughs> that gives him a place to dwell. By thy loving kindness, he upholds his throne. Isaiah 16, 5. In mercy, the throne will be established. Well, where's the rest of it? And one will sit on it in truth. In the tabernacle of David. I guess you know who that is. Well, now get over there again into Psalms, the 85th chapter. And you see mercy and truth having quite an affair. They're embracing and kissing. And why is mercy and truth met together? Why is righteousness and peace embracing and kissing? That glory may dwell in our land. Yes, it takes them both. Well, of course, we know what we can't glory in. We can't glory in our own wisdom. We can't glory in our own might. We can't glory in our own riches. But let, what can we glory in? Let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. But what I know about you, God, what specifically... How about to know that I can glory about that I exercise loving kindness. There's your grace. And righteous judgment. See, there's your two. two every time it comes back to it. Now what does God think about his definition of glory? He says, in these I delight. And that's the reason that we in our joy of it, are bringing him glory. And these two aspects of glory, of course, Exodus 33 was used tremendously this week. Glory, when Moses asked to see the glory of God, and he talked in these terms, well, I'll show you myself as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, yeah. But I'll also show you the goodness the rightness, and the truth. So there it was. Psalms puts it this way again in 145, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and he is glorious in all his works. Amen. And there it is. Now, as you begin to go through the Bible, this is stated so many times that it begins to overwhelm you. That the two aspects here of the glory of God. But I like to think then that the bedrock foundation of God is then his glory. That is where his throne rests. And he is delighted in it. And when Jesus upheld it, as you well know, his righteousness 
and his mercy. No wonder God's delighted in it. It saved the throne. Amen. Now, you want that glory? Wouldn't surprise me at all for you to not understand that you get it through faith. <laughs> Just like we get everything through faith. Every good thing. And glory is good. We get it through faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It is God's power unto salvation to all who believe, first to Jew and also to the Greek. Why am I proud of it? Why am I pleased with it? Why am I not ashamed of it? For therein is the righteousness of God made available, if you don't mind me using these Texas expressions. It's revealed, it's made available to you through faith. Amen. Well, how about the other side? Have you ever heard of that little thing? There is joy and peace in believing. There's your mercy. So now we get the glory of God through faith. But you realize that anyway. Now, a couple of thoughts. God's eternal purpose, then, is that created beings glorify Him. We said that to begin with. As He reveals His glory to us. Now, when I got that in my mind, then I read a passage like Psalms 85. It says, Surely His salvation is nearer to them that fear trust Him, that His glory may be dwell in our land. That I don't put my emphasis so much on my salvation as I put it on the glory. So I was saved for a, a purpose. Amen. And, and so I was saved to enjoy His glory now. And then I find out well, that's the reason you saved anyway, so you can glorify Him forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. so, so, so salvation, uh, oh my, we used to not even get too excited, maybe enough about salvation, but you can't stop with just salvation. That's the means to the end. Now the ultimate way then for us to glorify Him is to rejoice in Him, to thrill of His glory that he has revealed to us. Now, if you can thrill in his glory now, heaven won't surprise you. Amen. And if heaven surprises you, don't expect to stay long. Amen. So happiness now and in eternity consists in rejoicing in the Father's glory. Now I'd like to leave you with a few conclusions. God has a great interest in His glory. Amen. And He's got a great interest in my joy. And they're not at odds. No more than His justice is an enemy of His mercy. Now, God's righteousness, that part of His glory, is His unwavering commitment to uphold and display the value of that glory in all that He does. Well, now, of course, you know that would seem to require punishment for us that have fallen short of God's glory. But where does that leave His commitment to my joy? Thank the Lord they're ultimately not at odds because God through Jesus, as has been shown you here this week, has made a way to both be just and merciful or the justifier of us who have faith in Jesus. Amen. Now, therefore God's commitment to uphold the worth of His glory doesn't consign us to destruction. Rather, in the death of Jesus, God has conspired and worked out to vindicate his righteousness 
and justify sinners with his grace in one act. And that one act means to me his zeal to be glorified and his zeal for my joy at the same time. Now, since God is as committed to my eternal joy as He is to His eternal glory, a lot of passages begin to kind of perk mares up. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show His might on behalf of those whose heart is blameless toward Him. But he, he, even a passage like since I've been a child. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness, the righteousness of God. Mercy, the grace of God. He says, that together the glory of God. He says, surely, glory's going to chase me the rest of my life. He said, heaven's chasing you. Well, you knew that, but this is just a little different slant about it. The Lord your God, he, He'll ex exalt over you with joy. and He'll rejoice over you with shouts of joy. And then a statement like, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you a kingdom. Mm. But I want you to know, if God would do you good, He's got to direct your mind to his work. That means to his Amen. glory. So it's not so much of making much ado about you as it is making much ado about himself. Amen. So God-centered glory nullifies the false gospel of self-esteem. See, saints are delighted and pleased with the things of God. Now, when I find one of my brethren that's just delighted with their things, I decide I don't have much of a brother. Now, if we... Do you want to be virtuous among men? You've got to bring them to rejoice in the glory of God. Amen. Amen. I don't care if you take and feed them and house them and minister unto them in every kind of way if they haven't seen the glory of God there's no virtue ultimately there Amen. unless it comes from and leads to rejoice it, is, it first got to come from your rejoicing in the glory of God and lead them to rejoice in the glory of God that means that God is the center of virtue Amen. I don't care how deep you dug in your pocket he put it there to begin with. Do all to the glory of God. Now then sin is just the trading of the glory of God for the false glory of created things. It's changing the glory of God, of the incorruptible God for an image. And exchanging infinite value and beauty for fleeting and inferior substitutes. Taking forsaking a living fountain for broken cisterns. And all of this, God's derided in that you're dying. What is evangelism but depicting the glory of God in the face of Jesus? Showing the beauty of God, showing the beauty of Christ in their saving work with a heartfelt urgency of love that labors to help people find their joy in him and his glory. It's the outshining of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The gospel is not for felt needs, but people are for the soul-satisfying glory of God by the gospel. Amen. Preaching is the proclamation of the glories of God, or to put it in East Texas language, it's bragging about Jesus. Amen. 
It's designed to lure people from fleeting pleasures of sin into the obedient satisfaction of God. Preaching somehow must expose the suicidal pleasures of sin and awaken the fullness of joy in the Father of glory. What's an assembly for? Well, you would think someone would know before they were 50 years old, but most people haven't found out yet. The essence of assemblies is the collective experience of a heartfelt satisfaction and joy in the glory of God. Amen. Or a trembling that I don't have it and I desperately want it. Amen. Worship has always been for the sake of magnifying God, not ourselves. Amen. And God is most magnified when you are most thrilled with Him and not what you're doing. It is not coming with your hands, I'm going to show them, I'm going to sing for them, I'm going to preach to them, I'm going to pray for them, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right, we're not going to have an instrument or we're going to all on and on and on. is simply garbage. It's coming to God with an empty hand. Amen. It's saying, I'm thirsty. Yes. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. Amen. My soul thirsts for you, God, for the living God. So your songs and your prayers and your sermons, they're not duties. They're not even traditions. They're simply a means of getting to God that he can demonstrate his glory through him. Let me tell you, the affection for God is an end in itself. And now I know what I'm talking about right here. And we'll give you one, one example, prayer. That's part of an assembly, isn't it? Includes calling on God for help. He's, a, he's gloriously resourceful to help. And we're even saying here that we're humbly in need of it. We needed that help or that grace. And in that, God gets the glory and we get the help. So here's what the scriptures say about it. Call on me in the day of trouble and I'll deliver you and you'll glorify me. See? Uh -huh. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. There it is. Whatever you ask in my name, or we might say for my glory, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Amen. So you could go on and find all of the, we used to call them elements of worship. <laughs> I don't know where in the world that rituals uh, that we practiced was uh, our pathway to heaven. I don't know where we come up with that stuff. Well, what about death? For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The glory of Christ is magnified when we're more satisfied in Him than all death would take from us. That's right. Amen. So if you can count death gain, because it does bring you closer to God, you know, then we acknowledge that Christ is more to be desired than everything we leave, including all the world. Amen. Now what about hell and glory? I, I, I just not going to spend much time here, but God is going to be glorified whether it's through Christ or whether it's through hell. Because it's going to, he's going to vindicate the worth of his glory on those who refuse to be thrilled Amen. with him as the Father of glory. Amen. Now what about heaven? I assume Gibbon's going to talk maybe some about this, and I'm not going to say much about it. But God has at least seated us in the heavenly places in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing 
riches of his grace, or read glory, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now I take that to be an infinite number of ages for God to be done revealing the way of his glory, which is to say it won't ever be done if it's infinite. Not I tell you, if an old sheep herder from Tacoa, well, no, I'm a pasture mower from East Texas. You have thoughts. And I got to thinking, now, when I praise God, and I am ravished in love and thrilled with His glory, and then the scripture says, Leon, you're, you're adding to his glory. You're glorifying God in that. But all God does with his glory is share it with us and reveal it with us. And then when he shares me that glory, it just causes me to love him more. Don't the more you see of God's glory, the more you thrill him? Amen. But that says that's glorifying God. And then all he's going to do is just share more. And, and, and I suddenly get to thinking as I'm going around and around in that pasture and thinking it will never come to an end. I say, hey, I have found perpetual motion in heaven. And it's not going to be boring either. Oh, I tell you what, I know the rest of this that I get on this earth about 24 hours of it, and I am sick of it, the rest of the flesh. So I, I don't want to expect that in heaven, and I'm not. Now that was just me talking as I finally found perpetual motion without boredom. But I do know this, that ultimately and finally, your goal in life, whether it's all your study, all your sermons, all your life is a heart for God. Amen. And the best goal for any of our work is the glory of God. Now I've been testifying of it. You've testified it of it this week. And I pray to God that that has brought him more glory. But I'm going to tell you this. It's nothing to be compared with you appropriating it and being thrilled about it, Amen. delighting in it. That will redound to his glory. So I appeal to you to seek the glory of God by being ravished and satisfied in him above all things. The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. That's better than this life because actually it is eternal life. That's <laughs> what it is. So now you're ready for heaven. So to him is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. No wonder we can say, even so come Lord Jesus.